We're appreciative of your presence here this day. Beautiful Lord's Day that God has granted us once again to fulfill one of His commandments, to worship Him in spirit and in truth. Thank you again for being here. As we approach the big event of this week, that being Thanksgiving Day, I thought it would be appropriate for us to direct our minds this morning toward that theme, Thanksgiving. Next week we will resume our series on 1 Peter and we'll look at chapters 2 and chapter 3 of 1 Peter. But for today, let's consider that from Psalm 100. Entering God's gates with thanksgiving. I've heard in this very congregation many times prior to our worship we will have a reading of Psalm 100. I think Wayne likes to do that sometimes. And appropriately so. Let's read it once again. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who made us and not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter into His gates with thanksgiving and to His courts with praise. Be thankful to Him and bless His name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endures to all generations. When you think about this text of Psalm 100, uh, of course, probably in your Bibles, before the text begins, you will find that it is indeed a psalm of praise. And perhaps in our society, in the way we think of things today, we may even consider this psalm to be what we would call an opening song. Many times the first song that we sing will indeed be a song of praise, and rightfully so. But this psalm, Psalm 100, speaks of coming before God's presence and entering into His gates. And friends, if that doesn't humble you to think about coming into the very presence of God this day, I don't know what would humble your spirit. But nonetheless, the psalmist here tells us about the relationship God's people have with God. And he says the, the relationship is this, that we are like sheep, the sheep of His pasture. Many weeks ago, we looked at Psalm 23 and, and saw the relationship between the sheep and the shepherd. And that is the relationship that we have with God, with, with even Jesus. We are the sheep, He is the shepherd. The psalm here speaks of the goodness and the mercy of the Lord. And in a very short and succinct way, he captures the very essence of, of the goodness of God. Now verse 4 is the heart of the text and the title of our lesson. Enter into His gates with thanksgiving and into His courts with praise. Be thankful to Him and bless His name. You see, when we come to, together to worship God on a day such as this, we should come with thanksgiving in our hearts. I don't know about you, brethren, but most every time I pray, my prayer is a prayer of thanksgiving. We have that much to be thankful for that we could, we could pray 24 hours a day and never completely be finished with thanking God for the things He's done for us. Now, of course, Thursday is Thanksgiving, and that's a very appropriate holiday. And as Wayne said in his prayer, I'm so glad that, that people of our nation have decided to, to make this a holiday to celebrate. As Christian people, it's imperative for us to be thankful, not only on Thanksgiving, but every day of the year. So as we consider verse 4 of Psalm 100 this morning, let's think about three different ideas. Number one, we need to enter God's gates with thanksgiving because... Thanksgiving is the only appropriate response for what God has done for us. That's the only appropriate response that we have for everything God does for us. Number one, He is our Creator. The Creator of the universe. He created you. He created me. By virtue of the reproductive system. Isaiah in Isaiah 45, 12, speaking of God, says, I have made the earth and created man upon it. I, even my hands, have stretched out the heavens and all their host have I commanded. Isaiah speaks some very uh, deep thoughts here. Thoughts that perhaps our finite minds cannot grasp completely. Completely. 
But He reminds us that God is our Creator. Not only is He, he our Creator, Isaiah continues and tells us that, that He's our Sustainer. He it is who allows us to make it through each and every day of our lives. Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 3 says, Thou would keep Him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on Thee, because He trusts in, in Thee. He is our sustainer. He gives us life each and every day. Not only is God our Creator and our sustainer, but He is our Redeemer. He has redeemed us. We sing that song, Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. God did that for us. He bought us back with a very expensive price, and that, the blood of His Son. Again in Isaiah, this time chapter 44 and verse 6, we read this, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. That's enough to cause us to be thankful, isn't it? To realize, number one, that God created us. But not only did He create us, He's with us day by day and He sustains our very life. And then to know that He cares enough about us to redeem us, to purchase us back out of that life of sin. Now because God has done these things, we have no right but to be thankful for everything. We have no right to be anything but thankful. Thankful for our very existence according to Ephesians 5.20. Thankful for our daily bread, according to 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 4. But ultimately, thankful for salvation. I recall last year as I gathered together with my family for Thanksgiving, uh, as perhaps many families do, my father went around the room and asked, What are you thankful for? What are you thankful for? And people began to, to be thankful for their, their families and for their physical possessions, and that's good, and that's appropriate. But my response was, I'm thankful for salvation. Because without salvation, my friends, nothing else matters. Without salvation, we would have no hope of anything beyond this life except eternal destruction. Romans chapter 6 and verse 17, there Paul says this, God be thanked that you were the servants of sin. But now you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine that was delivered to you. He says that's something that you ought to thank God for. That you were a servant of sin, but now you're a servant of righteousness. And so how could we be anything other than thankful for what God has done? Thanksgiving requires uh, some things from us. It requires, number one, for us to focus on the blessings that God has provided. Primarily, I suppose, throughout the, the country, that will be physical blessings, but even spiritual. And when we stop focusing on the blessings that God has provided, that's when we begin to lose our perspective about thanksgiving. Not the holiday, but the idea of thanksgiving, giving thanks. And when we lose our perspective regarding thanksgiving, our relationship with God begins to suffer. See, thanksgiving is the only appropriate response if we wish to maintain a good relationship with God. So number two this morning, consider with me, why should we enter God's gates with thanksgiving? Number two, because thanksgiving brings about a change of attitude in our lives. Now, this is very important, and, and you've often heard me say that Christianity is a religion of change. Perhaps, though, sometimes we don't think about the change of our attitude. Thanksgiving brings about a change of attitude in the lives of Christians. You say, well, preacher, what attitude does Thanksgiving affect? Just about any attitude. But let's look at three attitudes Thanksgiving affects. <laughs> Number one, Thanksgiving leads to humility. Humility is a very important part of being a Christian. Because the wise man states in Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 23, A man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. Humility is important. Are you a humble being? Do you still kneel to pray? Now, I'm not saying that's a commandment, but certainly that does show us something about our attitude. Some of you can't even kneel. You have steel knees, don't you? <laughs> But are you humble or are you prideful? To say thank you to someone 
That acknowledges someone else's contribution many times to your success. It's an attitude of humility when you recognize you haven't gotten where you are alone. Friends, you can think about in your life people who have helped you on this earth get to where you are today. But have you ever considered the same about God? Were it not for God, you wouldn't be where you are today. And for that, you ought to say thank you. See, thankful people are humble people. When we're thankful, we'll be much less likely to be lifted up with pride. So thanksgiving leads to humility, but also thanksgiving leads to dependence on God through prayer. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6, the Apostle Paul says this, Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Now friends, prayer and thanksgiving go hand in hand together. Those two things go right along beside each other. See, the thankful person is a praying person. The praying person is a thankful person. You cannot separate the two. And when we are thankful in prayer, we then begin to recognize our reliance upon God in all things. Recognizing our dependence on God keeps out an attitude of selfishness. You've lived life long enough, and especially within the last 10 or 20 years, people are growing more and more selfish, aren't they? More and more we see people's attitudes who are, what can I get out of this life for me? But when we begin to be thankful to God and dependent on Him through prayer, then we'll begin to stamp out that selfishness and the humanism. So thanksgiving leads to humility and dependence on God in prayer. Number three, thanksgiving leads to joy. Thanksgiving leads to joy. In Psalm 97 and verse 12, the psalmist says, Rejoice in the Lord, you righteous, and give thanks at the remembrance of His holiness. People who are thankful are people who are content. And people who are content are people who rejoice. People who rejoice are people who are happy. And again, just as thankfulness and prayer go hand in hand, thankfulness and joy go hand in hand together. Friends, I want to suggest something to you this morning. If you want to be happy, be thankful to everyone you meet. Be thankful. Have a, a general attitude of thankfulness. But most importantly, be thankful to God. You see, when we fill our thoughts with gratefulness, with thanksgiving, there's not going to be any room for ingratitude and discontent. Thanksgiving brings about a change in our lives. Number three and finally this morning, Thanksgiving spurs us to action for the welfare and benefit of others. Thanksgiving spurs us to action for the welfare and benefit of others. And perhaps this is the most important point to be made this morning. You see, when we're thankful, we want others to have the same blessings that we have. When you have that attitude of thanksgiving, you say, well, well, I'd like to have uh, for other people to have the same things that I have. Instead of saying, boy, look at what I've got and they don't. In Psalm 107 and verse 22, the psalmist says, let the sacrifice of sacri the, excuse me, let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. When we begin to be thankful for our food, clothing, shelter, transportation, then we want to have uh, other people to have the same things. It's that simple. When we're thankful for a good life, we want others to have a good life. And when we're thankful for salvation, we'll want others to have salvation. Now that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? You say, well, preacher, it doesn't always work that way. And it doesn't because people are perhaps not as thankful as they should be. Not only will we want others to have the same blessings that we have, the same good life and salvation when we're thankful for it, but then we'll begin to do the things that are necessary to help them have those blessings. Food, clothing, shelter, transportation, a good life and salvation. Are you thankful for those things?
See, when we want others to have the blessings we have, we work toward that end in our life. I would direct your attention to Jesus Himself and the occasion of the feeding of the 5,000. In John chapter 6 and verse 11, as the event, the event is recorded for us, we read this. Jesus took the loaves and when He had given thanks, He distributed it to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down. And likewise of the fishes as much as they would. And of course you see here the, the thankfulness and, and that general attitude of thanksgiving that Jesus had here for the bread and fish. You say, well that attitude is good, but look at what happened here. That attitude of thanksgiving translated into an overflowing abundance of food. That shows me that Jesus, when He was thankful, He worked toward the end that He could bring the same benefits into the lives of others. <clears throat> the, you, you probably recall on that occasion actually that there was so much food that they had to take up the fragments in about 12 baskets. All because it began with thanksgiving. Consider also with me this morning the meaning and, and the significance of the Lord's Supper that we've already partook of this morning. It's supposed to be a time of thanksgiving, as Danny pointed out this morning. For instance, in Luke twenty-two nineteen, 19, as Jesus is instituting the Lord's Supper, you may recall it says He took bread and gave thanks and break it. And He gave it to them saying, This is My body which is given for you. This do ye in remembrance of Me. See, the Lord's Supper reminds me of what God in Christ did for our benefit and for our welfare, our, our well-being. But not only that, it reminds me of what we must also do for the welfare and the benefit of others in this life. And hence, we will be spurred into action. Number one, to worship God. Number two, to keep ourselves pure. And number three, to help others. I found it interesting in a verse we read a few moments ago, Psalm 97, 12. The end of that verse, of course, the psalmist says, give thanks at the remembrance of His holiness. So when you think about God and His character, His nature, and how holy He is, that ought to spur you to give thanks. Because that is our ultimate goal, isn't it? To be holy and pure. Because He was holy and pure. I want to close with Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 15. And may you keep this with you throughout this week and the rest of this year and even through the rest of your life. Hebrews 13, 15 says this, By Him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name. We enter God's gates with thanksgiving because, number one, thanksgiving is the only appropriate response for what God has done for us. We enter His gates with thanksgiving, number two, because thanksgiving brings about a change of attitude in our life. And number three, we enter His gates with thanksgiving because thanksgiving spurs us into action for the welfare and benefit of others. And so this week as you celebrate the holiday known as Thanksgiving, May you be reminded of these three points about thanksgiving. May your time of, uh, of sharing with friends and family and having a meal remind you of what God has done for you. Cause you to change perhaps an attitude in your life. And then spur you into action for others. Now this lesson has been about thanksgiving, of course. But we want to offer you the chance this morning to have the greatest blessing that has ever been offered to man. And that is salvation. I'm thankful that God has given us His Word that reveals a plan whereby we can be saved. We talked about that plan in great detail over the past few weeks. Have you obeyed that plan? You've heard God's Word multiple times. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing, and by hearing the Word of God. 
You have to believe that word. John 8, 24, Jesus said, Except you believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. You have to repent of your sins. That means you turn away from them and go toward God. Luke 13, 3 and 5, Jesus said, I tell you nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. You have to confess the name of Jesus publicly before men. Romans 10, 9 and 10, With the heart man believes to righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made to salvation. And ultimately our sins are washed away when we uh, do that final act of baptism. As the Pentecostians were reminded in Acts 2.38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Perhaps you've done those things this morning. Sometimes we fail to realize that there's one more step to be saved, and that is to live a faithful, godly life. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12 tells us that, that we should abstain from worldly lusts and live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present world. And so, friends, if you need assistance this morning in obeying the gospel, perhaps you need to rededicate your life or repent of a sin this morning. We give you the opportunity to do that and get your life right with God and begin a life of thanksgiving right now while we stand and sing.